Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Suffolk County Council Cabinet meeting. I always say that at the start in case anybody's in the wrong room. It gives them an opportunity. Um, so just a couple of points of housekeeping. Um, there are no planned fire alarms, so if it goes off, we all follow mark. No, um, the exits are clearly marked, and there will be people outside to escort us out of the building. Um, may I remind you that an audio recording is being made of the meeting, and this will be ava made available to the public. The council members of the public and press may also film, record, a photograph, or broadcast this meeting uh, when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded. Any member of the public in attendance today who wishes, um, who objects to being filmed, please advise us so that we can instruct you are not included in any filming that anybody may undertake. Are you okay with that, sir? All right, there we go. Excellent. Um, as I said, there are no fa planned fire alarms, so if one goes off, we exit the chamber. Right, we move to the first order of business on the agenda, which is the election of Vice Chairman of the Cabinet. And I would like to propose Councillor Storey. Do I have a seconder for that, um, Councillor Chairman, Smith? Chairman, I'm very happy to second that nomination. Since we all save speeches and words of various other things, we'll move straight to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you very much. We are unanimous in that. Congratulations, Councillor Story. How many minutes do you want for your acceptance speech? No, no, you've waived that. Excellent, marvellous. So as we have some new members here, I, I just think it's worth pointing out that um, this is a cabinet meeting. I invite people to, to speak um, and uh, welcome questions. Um, and, and I quite like singular questions as I look at Councillor Gage um, <laughs> instead of sort of batches of questions um, so that everybody has a chance to ask any questions they so wish. But when we do come to the votes, it's only the Cabinet that actually vote because this is the Cabinet meeting. So we move immediately to apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? We have received apologies for absence from Councillor Robin Miller. Thank you. Right. Declarations of interest and dispensations. Are there any declarations of interest or dispensations from the Cabinet, please? Nope, we have none, so we'll move swiftly on. Minutes of the previous meeting. Hopefully you've all had the papers circulated to you. You've all had a good chance to have a solid read of those and digested them. And are there any questions, points of clarification, alterations, or anything that anybody wish? No, we move forward. Proposed from Councillor Gawson. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Storey. All those in favour of the minutes being true and fair? Uh, I didn't see all the hands. You weren't present. OK, so you don't really feel you... OK, right. So we are unanimous apart from Councillor Finch, who wasn't present, present, so therefore feels he cannot vote on that particular item. We then move swiftly on to public questions. Are there any public questions tabled? There are no public questions today. Thank you very much indeed. We move on to standing item update from Scrutiny Chairman, who is Councillor Mary Evans. Councillor Mary Evans is on leave this week, so it falls to Councillor Ladd. The floor is yours, sir. the name towards you. So your name is just towards you and the chip is down. There we go. Sorry, I, I Councillor Ladd, the floor is yours. I normally have somebody do that for me. I think so. <laughs> right, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'm just here to present the uh, scrutiny uh, report through March and April, which I have to say seems like a lifetime ago uh, now. Um, I won't go through it in detail because obviously you've got them there, but I'll go through... Uh, first of all, the 1st of March, Education and Children's Scrutiny, which looked at uh, creating new school places and children needing help and protection. The Main Scrutiny Committee on the 8th of March looked at the Upper Orwell Crossing and Lake Lothing Crossing proposals, and there's uh, uh, many recommendations there, as you'll see on the page 15. The Essex and Suffolk Joint Health Scrutiny Committee on the 10th of March... Now, uh, I 
We'd like to just say a couple of things on this, if I can, because I think we're well ahead of the curve on this one. We've uh, uh, got our terms of reference in place. We've had our first meeting, so we're all there in position for when the uh, STP actually gets a little bit further down the line. Uh, as you know, these are sustainable and transformation plans, which are quite new, but we've got our joint committee in place, and we've had a couple of really good meetings, I think, so uh, uh, we're looking forward to scrutiny that as that moves through the process. Uh, health scrutiny on the 14th of March, that was a very big item, planning and provision of primary care infrastructure. We tried very hard to bring all the parties together on this one. It was very interesting that uh, when we did have them in the room, I think it's the first time they'd all got together in one room ever. So that was an achievement, I think, uh, by itself to do that. Uh, the Great Yarmouth and Waveney Joint Health Scrutiny Committee, which uh, we rotate the chairs with. I think I'm uh, picking up the chair in the next month on that. Looked at learning disability services, the out-of-hospital teams, and ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, if I could just say something else on this one particularly, um, because I think there is a concern north of the county, particularly in Waveney, that Waveney are in the uh, Norfolk STP, uh, and, of course, the rest of Suffolk is in with the Suffolk and North Essex. So I think there's concern at Waveney that Waveney may get sort of lost a little bit uh, in the Kings Lynn and Norfolk STP. Uh, the other complication is, as you probably know, is that uh, there will be an East Suffolk District Council in two years' time, and therefore half of that district council will be in the STP of Norfolk and half will be in the STP of Suffolk. So I think that's something which probably uh, needs to be looked at. Uh, and finally, Chairman, if I can, I've heard today there is a new independent chair of the Norfolk and Waveney STP, uh, and you may remember this name, it's Patricia Hewitt. She was a former Secretary of State for Health in 2005-07. to um, She stood down as an MP in 2010, but she's now been appointed as the independent chair of the Norfolk and Waveney SDP. So that's interesting. Uh, um, obviously, I can take questions, but I can, some of them obviously won't know the answer to, but I'm happy to take them back to the relevant committees if there are any comments or questions, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Ladd. So are there any questions to, from the Cabinet? Councillor Colson. Thank you, Chairman. Comment more than anything, really. Um, the agenda item six is uh, the 13th of June 2013, uh, four years um, later than perhaps we'd like it normally. But, however, um, the joint STP or the joint scrutiny with, with Essex, an issue that I've raised with Culture the Hospital is the fact that Culture the Hospital is an NHS trust, um, it, which isn't. James Paget is a trust, and West Suffolk is a trust. They're, they all have appointed governors from the county council or the district council. In Colchester, they have an appointed governor from, Col from Essex County Council, and I have repeatedly requested that we have one from here because a large percentage of their patients are from Suffolk, and we should have a appointed governor from Suffolk County Council. So perhaps that's something that through the scrutiny you can follow through as I follow through with the Health and Wellbeing Board and through my Cabinet role. And lastly, I think it should not be under-emphasised under the importance of Great Yarmouth and Waveney not being in Suffolk. It is a problem because the STP for Great Yarmouth and Waveney mm -hmm. is given residents in that area a substandard service. There are large inequalities in the services coming to Waveney to the rest of the county. Their funds are different, their funding structure is, well, not very good, and they are in trouble. They have five, CC, five CCGs in Great Yarmouth and Norfolk, of which Great Yarmouth is one. Here in Suffolk we have two, and they share the same chief exec. Therefore, they are much more efficient and their services are much more equitable over the whole of the county. But Great Yarmouth and Waveney is not. And I think that's something that we must pursue through this council, through my portfolio and through the Health and uh, Wellbeing Board and Health Scrutiny. Please, Michael. 
Thank you very much. I'm not absolutely sure there was a question in there, but, but no, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything for the answer there. It was more um, a statement of intent, which I, I do fully understand and I think we do need to be exploring. Any other questions for Councillor Ladd? Councillor Jones. Again, it's not a, uh, not a question, but just um, a couple of comments. Um, on the um, Education and Children's Services Scrutiny Committee under the agenda item 5.2, um, I met with the, uh, the Education and Learning Infrastructure Planning people yesterday. It's a working document and we are updating it and we will be bringing that to the various groups and the new members so they have a, a, a full in, in, input on that. And, e and equally on the uh, children needing help and protection, um, that is no, that's very much part of the compulsory training which is required. And I would make the point that um, some new members haven't, and current members uh, haven't signed up to it. It is compulsory and it really is uh, important uh, that we attend. It's one of the very important uh, responsibilities that we have as councillors. Thank you very much for that as well. Okay, right. Anything else for Councillor Ladd? Thank you very much, Councillor Ladd, for stepping in. Very much appreciated. So we will move on with the agenda, and we have agenda item seven, and this is the Red Lodge Academy presumption competition. Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Councillors will be aware uh, that uh, we've recently run a free school uh, academy uh, pres presumption competition to find a sponsor for the new primary school in Red Lodge, uh, due to open in uh, September 2018. Uh, the new school is needed uh, to provide more school places to meet demand for new housing in the community. The process of attracting and selecting sponsors uh, for a new school is set out in, the, in guidance provided by the DFE, which confirms the regional school's commissioner as the decision maker uh, on behalf of the Secretary of State. Senior officials from the regional school's commissioner's offices are heavily involved in the process and in the case of the assessment of application for Red Lodge uh, sponsor, the Deputy Rules, uh, Regional Schools Commissioner was a member of the assessment panel. The panel also comprised uh, officers from the CYP's Education and Learning, uh, Schools Infrastructure, Early year Years Teams, and the local councillor, uh, Councillor Robbie Miller. Uh, the competition attracted applications from three multi-academy trusts, uh, Chilford Hundred Education Trust, the Staplow Education Trust, and the Academy Transformation Trust. A due diligence exercise was carried out on Suffolk's behalf by the DFE's preschool group, which informed the initial assessment. The outcome of that assessment was that the Chilford Hundred Education Trust and the Staplow Education Trust were put forward for, for interview. The panel interviewed both uh, trusts, which gave uh, which gave present, a presentation and answers a, a, a series of questions covering the vision for the new school, the education plan including the curriculum, pupil performance, staffing structure and approach to in inclusivity, capacity and capability to deliver the new school and the governance uh, structure. The panel was highly impressed with the professional expertise and calibre of both, trust, uh, both applicant trusts both are already providing high quality education for children and young people and both have relevant expertise and the capacity to take on a new school. In short, the panel was satisfied that both trusts would be able to establish and main maintain the new school with excellent outcomes for students. The final decision on who the panel would recommend to the Cabinet as the LA's preferred provider was difficult but made finally on the basis that the, uh, the Chilford Hundred Education Trust uh, evidenced an unwavering focus on strong and distributed, distributed leadership and a proven good and better teaching uh, in its application, presentation and, and uh, interview. They would also bring the benefits of, a, of its close links to the Cambridge and Suffolk Schools Alliance uh, to the new schools and generally the wider area. Both trusts were informed of the outcome and obviously uh, the, the proposals uh, were, were delighted that they've been successful. 
Whilst the Stapler Ed Education Trust was not recommended this time, the Trust was regarded as, as very highly by the panel and we have agreed that we will meet them again to talk about further opportunities within Suffolk. I am satisfied that a rigorous process was carried out to select this trust, and I would ask that the Cabinet agree that the Chilford 100 Education Trust is put forward to the Regional Schools Commissioner for approval as the sponsor of the new Red Lodge Primary School. And we, are, we would anticipate a response from the Regional Schools Commissioner in July. Thank you very much, Councillor Jones. Any other member of the Cabinet wish to say something? Councillor Hicks. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, due process has been carried out, and when you think uh, this was brought to us back in, what, January last year. Um, just a couple of questions, really. I mean, to see... I mean, I, didn't know, I don't know much about educational trust, so I did spend a bit of time quickly Googling. Um, and it seems to me that the Staplow Educational Trust is very, 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 very highly rated. Um, so I was very glad to hear in your final few words at the end that you were going to meet with them to tell them how we can keep them involved because we really don't want to be scaring off when we get more than one applicant coming forward, both which are of such high quality, because we haven't always had that in Suffolk. Um, so it's not really a question, it's just a comment on that, which you have sort of answered. Just to, I, I probably should know, but can the um, Department of Education ever, or the Schools Commission ever turn down our recommendation? Has that ever happened? Or could it happen? I will have to defer to um, the, um, the, the director. Could it happen? I don't believe it has, and they were actually part of the, the panel. So I think um, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that it, that, that it would. But picking up your point, I mean, you're absolutely right, uh, and that's the, uh, with, with the, uh, the Staplow, that uh, we are continuing to engage. We do need good local maths um, to... For, the, for this area, not necessarily national ones, but good local ones. Your director was itching to say something. So, I was just going to answer the question. It could technically happen. It hasn't happened with an academy presumption process like this. We have had differences of opinion in the past and strong differences of opinion with the past for academy sponsors, for... Uh, supporting schools that require improvement or are inadequate um, and we've had disagreements about that but not an, an, not a process like this for a new school lovely thank you very much any other member of the cabinet no okay so this is where i open it up to other councillors present does anybody have any questions no right okay councillor jones if you'd like to wrap that up and move us to the vote uh, thank you. Um, what we're being asked to decide is that the Cabinet is asked to agree that the Chilford 100 Education Trust is put forward to the Regional Schools Commissioner for approval as the Council's preferred sponsor of the new primary school in Red Lodge. Thank you. So we will move to the vote. All those in favour of that, please so indicate. I believe that is unanimous. Thank you all very much indeed. So we swiftly move on to agenda item eight, the highlight of the day. Um, and uh, Councillor Finch, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Are you referring to my speech or the paper? <laughs> Obviously your speech. Mr Chairman, I wish to be extremely brief. Um, if I can say that this is a correction of an anomaly. Um, this is a housing estate that's been there 10 years or more where the developer, Persimmon Homes, has not been able to fulfill its function in terms of getting the um, waterways adopted or the surface water sewer uh, properly adopted. Um, and the reason it's not possible, as it says in the paper, is because it has not been possible due to the lack of knowledge on who the owner of the land which is required for easement of that sewer into the waterway, which is actually just south, I think it's south of the existing fire station. Um, now, why, or why is the council involved? The developer has kind of drawn a complete blank on who, who owns this land which is needed to fulfil, and therefore they can't buy it. 
Um, and the only way round that is to request the council to make a compulsory purchase order. Um, we, our team, have looked at this. Uh, Suffolk County Council Development Management are satisfied there is suitable highway benefit for this action to be carried out because actually if you don't get the sewer, the surface water adopted, you can't actually adopt the highway itself. So um, what is the reason for it? To enable the surface water sewer serving the state roads at Brett Vale to be adopted, therefore to enable those roads themselves to be adopted because we wouldn't touch those roads until they are formally adopted. Timescales, um, providing there's no objections, it is likely to be confirmed in four months as per paragraph seven, uh, following the approval of Secretary of State. It is a bit of a, you know, a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut, I'm afraid, um, and therefore the land then vesting in the council some four months later. And our plan is then to immediately transfer that to Persimmon um, all costs involved are being underwritten by Persimmon, um, and so there is very, if not any, risk to the County Council financially at all. And therefore, Mr Chairman, I would like to move um, the recommendation or the decision-making as per paragraph 3. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Any other member of the Cabinet wish to... Question? No, no, no. Are you sure? No, no. Okay, I open it up to other members of the council. Anybody wish to ask a question on this one? Councillor Gage, contempt you? No, no. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, we will move um, swiftly if you'd like to wrap up and just move the recommendation, and we'll go move to the vote. Of a compulsory purchase order. In, in respect of the land, which I didn't refer to in the page, which is a, quite a small... It's a ditch, to be honest, plus a bit of land either side. Um, it's a big purchase, um, which enabled Anglian Water to meet their, um, their commitments uh, to pursuant to Section 226, brackets 1B of the Town and Country Planning Act, 1990, and its subsequent transfer to Persimmon Homes Limited. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Finch. We'll move to the vote. All those in favour? I believe we are unanimous in that. Excellent. Thank you all very much indeed. Right, we move swiftly on to Agenda Item 9. This is the volunteer policy. Councillor Goulson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, volunteering is the ultimate exercise in democracy. You vote in elections, but when you volunteer, you vote every day about the kind of community that you want to live in. This quote by an unknown author sums up why supporting volunteering is vital for this council. This is about how we support the people of Suffolk to create the positive and welcoming communities they want to live in. As a council, we have never had a formal volunteer policy, and this is an attempt to pull something really simple and straightforward together that sets out how we will support people who volunteer with the council and what we expect from them. It also identifies how we will promote volunteers with our staff and support them to volunteer within the community. In terms of support to volunteers inside the Council, the number of people who volunteer with the Council is growing and the aim is for this to increase further. It is important that we attract high calibre volunteers to support our services, offer and retain them by making the recruitment process and delivering the role easy and enjoyable. Feedback from volunteers isn't always the case. This policy clarifies what support will be available to volunteers and those that manage volunteers at the same time as setting them clear expectations. Creating an employer-supported volunteer programme is in part about us providing leadership and putting our money where our mouth is. All our transformation plans have community resilience at the heart in terms of reducing the need to manage demand. Volunteering is a vital element of building community resilience. We are actively encouraging major employers to free up their staff to volunteer to build stronger communities as part of the volunteer strategy. This will be a challenge for us to do with any modicum of credibility if we are not doing our bit to ensure our staff can do what we are asking other employers to allow their staff to do. As well as supporting the organisation objectives there are other benefits for the Council. 
A research study by Barclays employee, employee Supported Volunteer Programme found that not only did the community talk more highly of Barclays, but their own employees were willing to talk of the bank's commitment to the community and recommend it as a good place to work. The more they volunteered, the more likely they were to talk highly of the employer. Adnams are also clear about the benefits their volunteering policy brings to their organisation. These include high retention, low sickness rates, increased brand awareness and brand trust, a deep connection with the community they are based in and sell to. This has led to them to double their volunteer days from 6 to 12 days a year. There are also benefits around training and development needs being met through volunteering rather than paying for training. For example, as many of us will know, being a trustee of a charity or social enterprise gives more leadership development than any course or programme ever could. The key issues that Cabinet need to decide are as follows. The difficulty of freeing up capacity when this is shrinking seems counterproductive. However, the benefits of volunteering to the organisation more than outweigh the costs. Also, this is already happening. There are many people in the organisation who are using flexible working practices to volunteer in their work time. This allows us to clarify and formalise what is acceptable. There are also significant benefits for the organisation in terms of reputation, staff well-being, staff motivation, increased understanding of the community we are making decisions on behalf of and the opportunity to improve the relationship with our local VCS. In essence, this policy is about putting into action the promises the organisation has made through the Health and Wellbeing Board and putting forward a proposal that will have a tangible impact on the organisation and the communities we are here to serve. And I'd like to finish with a quote from Oscar Wilde. The smallest act of kindness is worth more than the grandest intention. Very well said, sir, actually. Any other member of the Cabinet wish to ask a question? Councillor Storey. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, Councillor Goldson's outlined some of the many benefits that are um, coming to us as a council for introducing this policy. Uh, and some of them are, are indeed listed, paragraphs 22 to 26. But they're benefits for the council and also to the council. Um, by increasing their number um, and the support that we give to people who volunteer with us, and that's over a number of different directorates and in a lot of different um, aspects of, um, and roles within the council, uh, um, and also for our um, employees, it's it's uh, something that's possibly um, an intangible benefit, but nonetheless it is a, a benefit to any employee that wants to volunteer, and people do want to volunteer uh, you know p people do it in all sorts of different ways and this is a way for the council to go out into the community and and create uh, a positive feedback for Suffolk County Council uh, I'm sure that in all of our walks of life we we know of um, the sort of um, the where we've seen in the newspaper ha perhaps that a, a team has gone out and maybe cleared cleared a beach or they've cleared a recreation ground, done some other work, and that always gives a very good feeling, not just for the company that's um, that's promoting that or that they're part of, but also the community feel valued then as well. So I fully endorse this um, paper and have no hesitation in in supporting Councillor Goldson. Um, in his recommendations. Thank you for that. Councillor Jones. Um, I'll just pick up, um, again, it's a comment, not a question, um, with, with regard to school governors, which is the largest um, volunteering uh, group uh, in, in the country, uh, and what a great um, benefit it can be both to the governors, to the school, to the local community, uh, and, uh, uh, and I will do a plug. We are about to announce uh, next week uh, a programme uh, to try and track more governors, and so I would um, wish that um, we get a good response to that. Yes, I wondered where you were going with that, but then I worked it out, so great. OK, Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd just like to say that 
as a nominated councillor for the AOMBs, we, we do value the role of volunteers. And I think this opportunity here provides the council in another form for engaging with the community and being seen to engage with the community and enabling those other volunteers to understand what we and how we operate as a county council. So I, I particularly um, endorse the, the, the concepts of this paper and I, as Councillor Jones I'd like to do a plug and if anybody would like to come and help on the AOMB I will be so pleased to arrange the contacts so that you can know where to go. Um, it would be interesting to see that, um, you know, how you ended up, if I can ask a question specifically, how you ended up with a figure of two, a maximum of two per year, as opposed to having a number of days in total for the council. They're two days, not two people. Two days per member of staff who volunteer. Mm. Yeah. Two days per individual, is that? Yeah. Yes, two days, two paid days per individual. They can do 20 days if they wish, but they won't be paid for. Only two days will be paid. Okay, any other member of the cabinet wish to ask a question? Right. Okay, so I'll open it up to members. Oh, right, OK. Now, I think Councillor Stringer just pipped others to, to it. Councillor Stringer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, j just a comment, and then there will be a question, because uh, we haven't had one yet. Uh, the, uh, I, I, uh, I, ca I find it difficult to see how we've got this far without having one. I'm really glad we've got one now. Uh, I don't know how we got through the new strategic direction without one. Uh, good that we've got one. Uh, well done. It, it's quite a good one. There's one little bit of it uh, that, when I was trying to doze off last night, I thought was possibly missing, and we might possibly consider looking at it, is possibly putting an element in, in there of how us as community leaders volunteer. Uh, I see no mention of elected members there sh showing the way forward, whether we ca carry a list of where we volunteer and how many volunteer hours we put in uh, so we can show the way. Councillor, you really must bring your references up to date. There, there, are, there are a lot of new members who have never heard of some of the things of which you speak, but fair enough. Councillor Golson. Well, I thought we'd gone down a road we were down about six years ago, the new strategic direction. That, that went, that's gone. That's history. Um, how we volunteer, I suppose, uh, we all volunteer. I suppose we give about 40 to 50% of our time as volunteering and as council, as councillors. Okay, we've got Councillor Gage next. Thank you, Chair, and you'll be pleased to know just the one question. No, surely not. Yes, absolutely. So far, so far yes. I have to step up when you're leading. You know? Oh, I know, no, I know, no. Now then. Um, okay, page 34, paragraph 30. I just wanted to question Cabinet Member a little bit on that one. Um, in all other respects, I am... Um, supportive of the paper. I think it's um, actually a really good thing to see and acknowledge what I understand really our staff have already been doing for a very long time um, in the main. Um, so what I really want to question is paragraph 30 where it talks about a perception of a lack of financial or reduction of financial support to the voluntary sector um, from this council. And I just wanted to question that paragraph and what exactly you meant because surely we have seen have we not um, a reduction in grants to the voluntary sector in recent years um, and indeed our own locality budgets have seen a reduction which predominantly goes to voluntary sector to support them on capital investment and by not my calculations but my um, fellow councillor, councillor Mandy Gaylard who couldn't be here this afternoon calculations it amounts to three quarters of a million she estimates from the two um, reductions that we have seen. So I do wonder whether or not that, that paragraph is slightly misleading, Cabinet Member. No, it's talking about volunteering. We haven't reduced volunteering, we've increased volunteering. Thank you very much. Councillor Spicer. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think my specific question is probably for um, Councillor James Finch. But just, um, so my question to him is, um, an awful lot of the volunteers for this council that we all come across in rural areas are those people who go out and put the salt down early in the morning and wash the signs and things. Now, they, the arrangements, as far as I've always understood it, is they're covered by the county council's insurance if their names are provided to the county council. Okay. Um, I think we need to have a little bit of thought, and I'm sure James does, as to how those people can best be um, uh, integrated into this policy, because I don't think we're going to put them through all the what we expect of you and what, what you can expect of us stuff. But I do urge that we continue to acknowledge that unsung band of volunteers who support Suffolk highways. Um, and in connection with that, of course, the other great band of volunteers that some of us come across providing county council um, statutory services are those who volunteer um, in any um, organisation that we have a contract with to provide services on our behalf. And let's take the easy one to all recognise, which is the libraries through the... Where, do they, uh, where are they going to sit? How is the Health and Wellbeing Board going to share all this policy with them? And again, are they going to be considered to be volunteering with Suffolk County Council if actually they're working for one of our, sub, uh, our contracting partners, so to speak? Well, I, I, think, I think the protocol is that, that it's, it's for Councillor Gawson to answer, but if he wishes to involve Councillor Finch, then he's most welcome to, but I do think it's for Councillor Gawson because it is his paper. Councillor Gawson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, people who work in the community and wash our signs and cut some of the grass, etc., etc., are mostly volunteers in the community. They volunteer through their parish councils or however else. This paper is to set an example to other organisations of what we, as a county council, are doing. The Health and Wellbeing Board are rolling, will be rolling this out across all the boroughs and all the districts, and conversations have already started in some of those areas, as they have in Ipswich Hospital. So this is just the beginning. We, whilst we will set the example, and we hope others will follow our example. Cat. Councillor Gawson, are you happy to bring Councillor Finch off into this conversation before we, before we move off this, this subject? There we go. Councillor Finch. I just would like to endorse the comments. Of course, as a highways authority, we do value very clearly. But this paper, I think, specifically addresses how we and the team within the County Council can help other organisations. I take the point because we need to make sure that whatever volunteers are doing on the highway in whatever role, um, we need to make sure that they're not put at risk and we need to make sure that they are appropriately covered by insurance and that's what the process is done at the moment. But I think in the light of this, I think it would always look another, another eye over that would be worthwhile. You haven't answered specifically about an organisation like the libraries. So how are we going to influence them to perhaps sign up to something like this as part of our extended family. Councillor Gawson. I would think purely and simply by example and rolling this out across the whole county. That's what we're trying to do, uh, Councillor Spicer, and hopefully they will follow suit. But I think a lot of libraries do a lot of volunteering anyhow. Sorry, that was my point. They're ahead of us um, on, on a lot of this, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, for me, is it that you are leading by example or are you almost attempting to build it into your procurement process? And I think when something like this occurs, I think it is about leading by example rather than insisting because um, otherwise you're sort of rather negating the point of the whole idea of volunteering and putting something back. And, and so I think it's about us as an organisation showing leadership around this agenda and then in the nicest possible way saying to other organisations, well, what about you? And what are you doing in, in this space? So, OK, are there any other... Councillor Ladd. 
Thank you, Chairman. I do think it's right that the County Council leads on this particular thing. It's, uh, you, know, you can't expect other organisations to do it if you don't do it yourself. Um, um, I think Councillor Golson mentioned my old company there, and I was uh, heavily involved in uh, that, so I thought I'd better just make a couple of, a couple of comments. Uh, the first thing is it uh, really goes to the heart of any organisation uh, because it's very difficult in these times to uh, uh, let people go to volunteer during work time. Um, companies are very lean and it's very difficult for them to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, two things. One is you do get more loyalty. You do get more engagement from your employees. Very much so. That's true. Um, you also get uh, a little bit more, can I say, personal development. And I think if you're cute, actually, you can, you can get these credits towards your CPD, which is your personal develop, uh, development uh, program, so you can use it for that. But the other key thing is about corporate social responsibility. There are a lot of organisations who say they are very social responsible, but not really. They do say that in their publicity and their literature, but when they get down to it, they're not actually doing it. And I think it goes, as I said, right to the heart and the culture of the organisation. And you can, of course, cost those hours as well, which is a key point. So actually, uh, you know, cost how many hours you send your employees out to do volunteering, and that leads into your social uh, responsibility element. So I think it's a really good thing to do, uh, and I'm very pleased this come today. Hmm. Thank you for that. Right. Any other comments from anybody? No? Okay. So, Councillor Golson. If you'd like to move, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we're being asked to um, agree to the introduction of the volunteer policies in Appendix 1, which contains the two elements. A, a clear commitment and outline of the support available for those volunteering within the Council, and B, the introduction of an employer-supported volunteering programme. And part two of that is, as part of the implementation process, to delegate the responsibility for approving staff guidelines to the Head of Human Resources. Thank you very much for that. So, we'll now move to the vote. All those in favour? We are unanimous in that. Excellent. Thank you very much.